at a minimum, we should be a little bit more suspicious of anyone who seems to think there is one true way of working. My subconscious, I think, knocking at me, being like, "What are you doing?" What does success mean to you then? Paul Millard followed a conventional path, MIT MBA, McKinsey and BCG, but a health crisis in 2017 changed everything. He left it all behind and created his own way, what he calls the pathless path. But what I effectively did was go from $150,000 to there wasn't really a moment. I think we get a bit confused because we imagine there are these bold moments of leaps of faith, right? Oh, I had this moment of inspiration. I decided to go for it. Not how change happens. Change happens slowly and it's through and a lot of that did emerge after my health crisis, but I think the reason that happened is because the health crisis made me really just look at my life for what it was. You've worked in investment banking. Some people genuinely love this stuff. Aren't you nervous you don't have a job? It's like, no, this is the best I've ever felt in my life. And what you realize over time is there's so many memes out there, like follow your heart, do what you love, follow your passion. I think they're directionally right, like they make sense, but they're not the full story. So you have to find joy in the act of the work itself. You might find work you love, but it might not pay the bills. So then what do you do? I love happy romantic love stories. Meeting Angie was another pivotal moment that shaped not only Paul's personal life, but also his path forward. I was just like, I don't know. I, I met this person. I can't, I don't even have words for it, but it, something is happening <laughs> we just found permission to be ourselves and there are no stories we're beholden to about who we're supposed to be selves it felt like we were going to write a story of our own together which we sort of have <laughs> Paul didn't transform overnight it was a slow deliberate journey of letting go of what he thought he had to be and it was the first time in my life I really let go and I started to realize, wow, I was in such a narrow bubble. The space that we created for ourselves after we let go, and it's sort of like you start from scratch, but really listening to who you are. I enjoyed a lot of parts of it, um, but I was never satisfied. I could never be with myself and be content. It feels like the world is accepting you, you being who you are. Because people on the default path are on the default path because they want to make their fears go away. Like, the best way to make progress sometimes is to not do anything. And I know at the end of my life, these are the moments, the experiences, the chapters in my life I'm going to be like so happy with. I'm getting paid a lot more to not work. The thing is like, just be clear, if you want the fancy house, don't delude yourself into thinking you can have it all in terms of the time freedom and stuff. And I got paid in other benefits. Peace of mind, connecting with myself for the first time, showing up as a happier person, attracting better people into my life. It was sort of shocking to me, and it actually cured my financial insecurity. Now, Paul's journey isn't just his own. It's become a community of people walking their own pathless paths. I hope you do, because I'm always looking for more friends to join me along the way. It's worth reaching out to people. Three months is not a big deal. Three months out of the 500 you might work in your career, that's less than 1% of your working life. What are the steps I would need to take to get back to where I am now? And for many people, they have a boss that likes them or some connection somewhere. And the step is literally, oh, send one email. Preview oh. copies. <laughs> what brings you alive? Hi, Paul. Hello. How's it going, Lydia? Great. It's so nice to have you. Welcome to the Escape 9 to 5 podcast. I'm excited to have you finally here. Um, so I want to kick things off from quote from the Pathless Path that really resonated with me. You said, at a minimum, we should be a little bit more suspicious of anyone who seems to think there is one true way of working. I love this because it really um, captures the idea that there's no right single way to live or work and it's been a guiding light for me as well for my own journey and that's exactly the reason why i have this podcast called escape nine to five and you are the perfect profile and guest that i want to have for this so on your linkedin your title is a curious human and writer which is such a powerful and free-spirited identity um, but you also have a lot of 
by the traditional measures, very substantial and previous past was this conventional successful one like MIT MBA and uh, McKinsey and BCG and stuff. So welcome to the show and、Thank、feel free、you. to add anything if you want. Yeah, no, I I appreciate that and、um, yeah, we, we'll dive into it. But a lot of why I try to describe myself simply is I think I was in the wrong path for more than ten years, including. School, and、uh, yeah, curious human feels much more aligned with what I'm meant to be doing in the world than consultant or all of that. Yeah, like doing PowerPoint、uh, slides every day. <laughs> <laughs> We're all been there. So usually, I I let my guests to tell us a little bit about your their escape nine to five, but by telling me three statements with two truths and a lie, escape nine to five version. If you can tell me about that, I will guess which one. Oh, it's、like. Escape Nine to Five version. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think one of these is in the Pathless Path, which you've read. I've lived in over forty places for a week or more since quitting my job about seven years ago. I once cried in my boss's office, talking about potentially leaving the company、um, and becoming a freelancer. And my first gig was a career coach, calling myself Paul the career boss. <laughs> I think that all sounds like true.、Mm, I remember there's something that happens in your boss's office. I don't remember whether it's your cry in his office or after the office. So I'm gonna guess that one. <laughs> so that one's true.、Um, okay. And that one was like very much my subconscious. I think like knocking at me, being like, "What are you doing? <laughs> you don't want to be here." But th- the lie is, I did do career coaching, but I called it careers with Paul, not Paul the career boss. <laughs> so you've lived in forty places for over a week. For how long?、Mm-hmm. Like、um, throughout seven years. What's the shortest, and what's the which one is the longest? Uh, probably about a week, seven to ten days for a few of them, and the longest is a couple of my apartments in Austin for ten months, twice now.、Mm. So now you are in your apartment in Austin. You are based in Austin for ten months. Yeah,、know. but we may go nomadic again. So still TBD. <laughs> yeah, I'm a nomadic at the moment. I think there's some beauty to it, but it's whenever I need to find the next place to stay, it's so much headache. I just don't. I just want to get rid get rid of everything I own. Like honestly, <laughs> we'll have that question later in the podcast. So、awesome. that's the first segment. It's the two thousand and nine. Thanks so much for sharing with us. And usually, I ask people why did they make a change. I actually reached out to you、um, when I first read the book, The Pathless Path. At the time, I just moved to London and started my career in in the banking industry. Not not started. I continue my career in London, but it feels like a restart because I moved to a completely new place. So whatever that you wrote there actually resonate me a lot, and because I kind of feel like I was alone on whatever journey I was on, and I remember you ended the book, The Pathless Path. With I hope you do because I'm always looking for more friends to join me along the way, and that really gives me the courage to reach out to you. And you replied my email. I was so happy. I remember I talked to my French teacher. I was like, you know, I reached out to this author, and he replied me. So,、um, you spoken about how a health crisis, and maybe that's part of the、um, the scene that you cry in your boss's office.、Uh, it's like a turning point for you. Was that the、yeah. moment, or how did it? Um, propel the yeah.、Team. So, so f- first, I just wanted to say on your point of reaching out to people, I think more people should do this.、Um, yeah. I think people imagine like I do have a decent sized audience, but not that many people reach out to me, and even fewer reach out with very thoughtful、uh, emails, which yours definitely was.、Um, so, it it's worth reaching out to people. Uh, mm. Also, creative people tend to be somewhat intellectually lonely, in that they don't have a lot of people in their lives doing creative work. So it can just be great to connect with people, and yeah, it's 
it's still genuine. And if people want to reach out, email me. Might take a bit longer now, mostly because I have a daughter now, uh, mm -hmm. but not because I'm trying to ignore people. Yeah, I share that now. Like now I have, I reach out to everyone. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and I think the moment for me, I, I wrote about this in my first book, The mm -hmm. Pathless Path. There wasn't really a moment. There are a bunch of moments when I came to awareness of shifts inside of me. And I think this is often how people actually experience transitions. I think we get a bit confused because we imagine there are these bold moments of leaps of faith, right? Mm. Oh, I had this moment of inspiration. I decided to go for it. Uh, not how change happens. Change happens slowly and it's through small moments of revelation along the way, right? It's, I did some experiments or writing. It's like, ooh, this feels better than my day job. I'm going to keep going with this, keep experimenting. But it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to quit my job and become a writer. It was really just like following the energy. Um, and a lot of that did emerge after my health crisis. But I think the reason that happened is because the health crisis made me really just look at my life for what it was. And I sort of was disconnected from this, like, in in the zone, going with the flow, um, obsessed with prestige. Like, I was very caught up in my own drama. And then becoming sick helped me snap out of it, take a, like, third-person perspective at my own life and just be like, okay, this is, like, just a job. This is just a career. It's not that important also i don't even know if it's that important to me like mm -hmm. i think the entire time i was in the consulting field i had to really care i had to like pretend to care more than i did i liked it for a bit because i was challenged but uh by the end i really had trouble um caring like as much that. as the people around me and that's the thing i mean you've worked in investment banking some people genuinely love this stuff yeah. Right. And what you realize over time is these high intensity professions, they self select for people who do actually care. And it's just hard to realize when your moment is of, oh, okay, maybe I'm not really a fit for this. Um, and then stepping off and trying to find a new path, that's, that's hard. Um, and that's why it's great people like you are sharing off ramps for people that are going to resonate with your story instead of mine. Yeah, I think so. I think it's so hard, especially like I grew up in China, especially back in the days, like people encourage you to follow your heart. Like, <laughs> I mean, get your life together first. I, I am grateful that I grew up in that environment. It makes me very um, cautious about things, which gives me a relatively um, enough cushion for me to do what I do now to experiment things. But it's really hard if I had I not e experiment with, for example, YouTube or following stuff from like Ali and yourself and to realize that as you quoted on the pathless path about what success means, like be you, you, you said it because if your success is not on your own terms, if it looks good to the world, but does not feel good in your heart is not success at all. It took me a while to realize that like because everyone around me have the same definition of success and it feels like that's the only path but now slowly realizing having conversations like this and you sharing with me um i think it really helps me a lot yeah i i think there's so many memes out there like follow your heart do what you love follow your passion and the i think they're directionally right like they make sense uh, but they're not the full story. I think it's sort of like go after what you care about and there might be huge payoffs for that, but you may have no promise of making money from that, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to find joy in the act of the work itself. And that that's sort of what I'm getting at in this new book, Good Work, is that you might find work you love, which I did with writing, but it might not pay the bills. So then what do you do, right? Do you decide to pay the costs of that 
in today's world where people will judge you until the end of time, like some people in your lives, friends, family, they may never change their perspective of seeing you as a failure for leaving a successful path, right? And you can probably understand that, right? I think you growing up in China, like your parents' generations saw a transformation in the economy, yes. right? I think um, my wife growing up in Taiwan as well, like her grandfather grew up like in really challenging times. And now she's like doing stuff in the internet and married to an American. That's, it's so crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Right? And so I don't think our brains even have the ability to catch up and write new scripts for like what we should actually be doing. When I think about my daughter's path in life, I have no idea what to even think. Right. But the trap I see other parents getting into is them wanting their kids to repeat their path. Right. It's like, yeah. oh, the, the new one now in the U.S. is like, oh, I'm going to send my kid to an entrepreneur entrepreneurship school and they're going to learn how to like start a business and it's like maybe but like maybe that's the default path that like they're going to want to run away from 20 years from now exactly i think it's the i don't have kids but i listen to some of it sometimes people talk about how you how you how do how you do parenting is like you you don't want to write a path for your kids no matter you don't want your kids to do the things that you you wish you could have done maybe that's not yeah. what they uh, but you you mentioned about your family and we just saw, listen that your daughter has just cried hope that, <laughs> that i i love happy romantic love stories if you we can time travel back to the moment that you actually met angie at the buddha tea house um your wife and life partner for the first time. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that day? I was wishing to read a little bit more detail in the book. Um, do you remember yeah. your action when she says she thought you would be one of those uh, douchey, successful McKinsey guys? <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're going to get more detail. Angie's actually writing a book in Chinese oh. about everything. Um, yeah. So that should... <laughs> She she's much better at like bringing alive scenes and details of times. But I think that whole first month in Taiwan was very magical for me. And it was the first time in my life I really let go. Mm -hmm. And when I say let go, I mean, let go of everything. I let go of expectations. I let go of like hoping that I'd meet someone. I let go of any sort of identity I had. And it was easier to do this because I was literally in a country where I couldn't read the read the words. Uh, I could kind of speak for like food, like you learn food pretty quick. Yes. Um, but I was just letting go. And that's when I found writing. And then about a month after I arrived, I met Angie. And so my I don't have like detailed memories of that that first day. Uh, but it's more the first week. We actually hung out, I think, four times in the first week. Oh. And then the second week, I went on a, trip, on a trip with my friend Brian. And I was just like, I don't know. I I met this person. It's, I, I can't, I don't even have words for it, but it something is happening. <laughs> and it was just really exciting. Like, I just wanted to spend all my time with her. It was very simple. Um, neither of us were playing games. We were just hanging out with each other as much as possible. And I was not doing anything. I had no income, no work <laughs> besides like waking up and writing in the morning. And she was going through the process of quitting her job. So it was very much a time filled with like possibility and excitement for both of us. And I think in that emergent relationship at the beginning, we just found permission to be ourselves and be ourselves in the there are no stories we're beholden to about who we're supposed to be selves and it, it was very freeing i think she rejected a lot of the default path in chinese culture i rejected a lot of the western default path of like money and more um and yeah it, it felt like we were going to write a story of our own together which we sort of have <laughs> Do you think that you would 
fall in love if had you not quit your job, would this meeting would happen? Because sometimes I feel like when I was working, I don't think so. I just like there's no headspace for whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a tension. I'd always be on dates with the wrong people. Yeah. Uh, I and. I say wrong people. Like I was attracting a certain kind of person that was exactly like the person I was showing up as. So I was going to work. I had these successful jobs. I was still trying to like get more successful jobs, and so I'd go on dates with people and meet people that were also career driven. And then I would say stuff like, "Yeah, wouldn't it be cool to like quit our jobs and travel for a year?" And they're like. Aren't wouldn't you be worried about getting a job again? And like, it wasn't the problem. Wasn't them? The problem was me. I was still bullshitting myself. Like I wasn't doing anything about what I really wanted.、Mm. Right. Yeah. And so there was this dissonance between I think what my heart wanted and who I was showing up as in the rational part of my brain. And so after I quit, I went through this process, which I detail more in Good Work, of like trying to shut off the rational brain about what I should do, and just like step more and more into the unknown. And the more I stepped into the unknown, I did start meeting people that were more aligned with what I wanted. Or at least meeting people that were outside the previous bubble I had met, and I started to realize, wow, I was in such a narrow bubble of people. Like everyone had the same political beliefs, everyone had the same career aspirations, everyone had the same desire for like a McMansion in a fancy school district, and it's like all those things are fine, but I didn't think I wanted any of them. Yeah, I I felt the same way. I think after I left the job, the first several days I met people outside of the traditional nine to five world, and the people I met is just naturally more、um, the other people that I want to meet. Like, had I am still working in investment bank, there's no way that we can have this conversation and make that happen, and、right. I wouldn't be able to go to all of the other events and meet the、um, the startup founders. Now I'm like. In the circle of, as well. So I think the the space that we created for ourselves after we let go, and it's sort of like you start from scratch, but really listening to who you are.、Um, I remember you you talked about the trip in Taiwan in your new book, The Good Work. I remember there's a scene. I really love the scene that you're in the、uh, Daan Forest Park, and there's also a sketch about like. It's like recreating the scene that you're sitting next to the tree.、Uh, maybe just a little bit of sneak peek、uh, for our listeners as well、um, about that day. Yeah, it it was early on, and I was just like, I was so overwhelmed with、uh, feeling. I I think that trip to Taiwan. I don't know why, but it really enabled me to get in touch with myself in a deeper way. And it it was a simple park. I mean, it's a nice park. There's nice parks everywhere, though. And there were these trees from all over the world. There was this huge bamboo tree. I still have a picture of it. Like I was, I have pictures、um, from that day, and so. The illustrations like an exact replica of that part of the park, and yeah, I I just felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be.、Mm. Like I was exactly where I was supposed to be, and it clarified that I hadn't been where I was supposed to be for so many years, and、It's- that. That was hard to face, but it was like, oh man, I found something that feels right, and I think I had been so discontented for so many years. Like so much of my job hopping and career aspirations and drive behind trying to find better and better jobs and move and pursue achievements, I did have, I enjoyed a lot of parts of it. Um, but I was never satisfied. I could never be with myself and be content. 
and it was so interesting being in Taiwan. I I had no plans. Like I was not trying to find any work. My savings account was dwindling, but I just felt like okay about myself for the first time. And it it was so nice. <laughs> and it just made me so sure to like keep going. And that that was basically three weeks before I met Angie. And it was also a couple of weeks before I was sitting there and I was like, oh my gosh, writing. Writing is something I enjoy. I should commit to this. I think maybe there's a sense of acceptance, like feels like yeah. the world is accepting you of you being who you are, just like original form, being the creative and curious human being as you want yourself to be titled rather than the successful figure in other people's eyes that you don't particularly enjoy um, as well. Yeah. And there's like, there's a certain amount of magic you can tap into in the world once you release control over the world. Yeah. And I think that's what I, I've experienced enough of that over the last seven years to be a lot more open-minded about like possibilities in the world. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's still sort of wild. Like I have a daughter now with this woman I met in Taipei. And the crazy thing is we matched on a dating app six months before when I visited for a week. And I totally didn't think about her the entire first month I was in Taiwan. And then suddenly she popped into my head mm -hmm. and I sent her a message. And then two days later we meet. And then a year later we get married. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. all meant to be. Yeah. Well, and my, that. my, uh, one of my good friends, Irv, he had moved to Taiwan to get better at Chinese. He's Chinese American. He had traveled the world for a year, went there. And then he met his now wife a month after arriving. <laughs> so I don't know. Th this is my dating advice is like, just go to Taiwan and you'll probably meet your spouse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. People, guys take notes just to go to Taiwan. <laughs> Would you say that that's one of the most unexpected uh, surprise that since you have embarking on this path, like meeting Angie? I, th I think it's the best thing that's happened to me. Mm -hmm. because I know a lot of people when they quit their jobs and they're doing their own thing, it can be really lonely. That first year was really hard for me. I didn't have internet spaces or an audience where I was easily meeting and finding the others. And so I really was by myself, I felt. And I didn't know how to share the emotions and the uncertainty to people. And a lot of people didn't want to hear it. Because people on the default path are on the default path because they want to make their fears go away. And it mm -hmm. sort of works, like, basically, because everyone agrees not to talk about your fears. But on my path, like I'm face to face with the uncertainty and I needed to talk about it. I didn't really find people. I met a few people in that first year and they became really good friends over time. But yeah, and then I met Angie and then it just made it a lot easier because I had this person in my house. We moved in together after four months. So I had this person with me that we've shared everything from the early days. And I, I think this is why I wanted to write about her story too, mm -hmm. because her journey has been so uh, along the way with my journey. Like I've had my path and I, I've been slightly ahead of her. I think, but she's on a very similar journey. And a lot of my path has been about creating space for her and spending a lot of time with her, supporting her on her journey too. And it's hard to separate the two at this point. Like we're so aligned around like channeling creativity and curiosity in our lives. Those are two of our values for our family. Yeah, I found it so moving when I read those stories because you mentioned it a little bit in the first book and then you wrote a little a lot more in your current book. We will look forward to uh, reading Angie's book when it's out. And yeah, and I think I realized I had to tell this story because so many people um, on these paths have like a, especially in the US, they'll be self-employed, but they have a spouse that 
works at like a big tech company and yeah. has health insurance and a high salary. <laughs> I think that's great, but that's a completely different journey. Exactly. Um, Angie and I are a bit insane. <laughs> Uh, we're just willing to sacrifice a lot more relative to what other people want, especially in the U.S. And yeah, I, I thought it was worth sharing that. I thought it might be maybe even harder for her because I, I grew up in a traditional Chinese family. Like the, the value that we strive for is not something like go onto a path that you just explore what life offers to you. <laughs> Yeah, interestingly, I think her parents have been pretty cool. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. But this also could be just because they have more of like traditional values. Like they were so happy that we got married. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. And <laughs> that she was married and like now has a kid that like they don't really expect her to be like professionally successful. A lot of that pressure comes from herself. Um, yeah, so yeah. yeah, in that regard, she hasn't really had the pressure from her family. Um, but yeah, it, it's been a little, but it's only been a little easier because her parents don't really expect her. <laughs> yeah, I think the cultural uh, norm in different cultures is worth another episode to talk about. I think uh, a lot of the pressure is internal, right? She has this pressure on herself, like we need to take care of her parents. But yes. her parents are like much better off financially than her. So like they never let her actually pay money. And I mean, what happens is we give them money in a red envelope, then they give us money back in a red envelope. And it's like a big circle. Like <laughs> we couldn't, we can't even like give them money if we try. But I think that's a beautiful thing too about Chinese culture is there's just this like, circulation of like hey we're all looking out for each other yeah it's like a big village <laughs> like people all think that they have a say in your life because they will support you if you if you have a problem like if you need really need something um, yeah it's it's a different culture so you wrote very beautifully about creating space in your life for good things to happen to emerge i've my favorite quote from the pathless path is don't rush things remember nothing good gets away as long as you create a space to let it emerge. Uh, you touch upon it uh, just now for multiple times. How do you personally measure the balance between creating space and knowing when it's the time to push forward, like the pace and everything? Yeah, I'm still learning. I think it's even harder with a child now. Mm. And that's something I've struggled with over the last year and a half. I think it was way easier before having a kid. Me and Angie were very independent and kind of did our own things. And I was doing every seventh week off, like I just do nothing. Uh, what Angie and I are doing now is we sort of rotate doing solo trips. Uh, she's done a couple, I've done a couple, and we just go and wander. And this is where it's great having somebody that's also creative and knowing how important that solitude and wandering is. Um, so I've done a bunch of different things. I have been in pretty steady, like move forward mode with my book, which a lot of times feels like leisure for me, especially when I'm in the flow of words and excited about um, making sense of what I'm thinking. But yeah, it, it's it's something I'm constantly experimenting with because I think the space is where this like, you almost like settle into yourself in a deeper way and you get to know yourself, which I think is really important for writing. So I need to make sure I do that. Like the best way to make progress sometimes is to not do anything. And I sort of found that through writing my first book and taking those weeks off. I would take every seventh week off start writing the next week. And then that next week, like so much cool stuff would emerge. And so I've done it in the past couple of years. I've done days where I've done a 12 hour walk. This is a, um, I, I forget the guy, Colin O'Brady. He walked yeah. across Antarctica 12 hours a day, much crazier than me, but he has this thing of like, go take a 12 hour walk. He has an app for it, which only shows you maps and turns everything else off. 
and you just go wander. And I love doing things like that just to be with myself. And it really lets me tap into this like deeper magic of the universe, I think. Yeah, I think both of you found it right. It's like a match made in heaven. Like I, I seldom hear people that still do solo trip after they're in a couple. Um, I love solo trip myself, but some of my friends, they either couldn't get it or like if they're in a relationship, usually it's more difficult to do even a trip without their spouse or partner. So yeah, that's, I think creating space is very important as well. Like for my own experience, I've been thinking like the space in time and in my brain for me to be able to get energized to do what I really enjoy doing um, is something that I would never get if I had a traditional um, corporate job. So. Yeah, and I, I think these things are really important in a relationship too. Like Angie actually encouraged me to take a solo trip uh, about nine months ago. And this is actually how this book, Good Work, started. Yeah. Because I was able to be with myself and get some space. I was still in this like, oh, I can't leave my daughter. I can't leave when it's still like pretty crazy in that first year. But those two days, they helped me show up better as a father. They gave me a very clear sense that, okay, I need to find a connection with writing again. I need to find a way to make this work. And I sort of started writing something there that led to good work. And it helped me uh, make sense of what that was going to look like. Yeah. So... I think it's a little bit, it's a little bit easier for you. It must be a lot easier for you now compared to a few years ago. Um, but you have this shift from surrounding yourself with people who are in the traditional path and compared to now you surrounding yourself with more creators. How do you, but there's still expectations and societal pressures to like keep hustling, um, yeah. get things done. How do you embrace the balance between slowing down and get things done? It's hard. Um, I don't. I don't have a good answer to this. I I find it very hard in the U.S. After living elsewhere, um, this this country is incredible. If you want to make a lot of money and you want to be ambitious in traditional ways, and if you want to be entrepreneur entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it is hard to disconnect. It is hard to tap into a slower pace, especially when everyone around you is working all the time. I think one thing I'm struggling with now and I don't have a good answer to is I take care of my daughter two or three days a week. And I love that. But there aren't like other parents I know to hang out with. All the parents I know are working um, and they have their kids with like daycare and nannies and stuff. And so it's hard. And I think that's sort of like the next phase of our life of like figuring out what that looks like. Yeah. It's difficult if you're, I don't know, I don't have a kid, but if you love doing it, I guess it's something that worth experimenting and see maybe next yeah. book you can talk about good parenting or something <laughs> like that. We'll see. That's such a controversial topic. So many people have told me I should write something though. I'll, I'll just see if it makes sense. We're going to talk about a good work. It's going to launch soon. Congratulations. Uh, so Thank we you. really want to, want, want to talk about mm. more about this book. Pre preview oh. copies. Nice. Did you design the cop copy yourself? I worked with the designer, but I am making the final edits now myself. I've like, I'm very, um, yeah, I like to be very hands-on with the whole process. Um, so I, I love that it's very, very clean. Yeah. I'm editing it a little. I'm like doing some spacing stuff, but yeah, I think it's going to come out awesome. Yeah. So I, I luckily enough to be able to receive this advanced copy. So you talk about how a life built around good work requires you to be brutally honest about what you truly want and how did yeah. writing this challenge you to be even more honest with yourself? <laughs> yeah, I think. I have this chapter called the puzzle of good work. And it's really about me losing connection with work after my daughter being born. And 
that solo trip I just mentioned earlier, I went and I realized, man, I, I need to write. I have this inside of me. I'm not setting up my life such that this is writing is happening. And so I basically realized I need to uh, try everything. I basically started working outside of the house. I created like a scheduled work week with my wife, uh, which we do not like to do. <laughs> like we like to just go with the flow. Um, and yeah, I, I tried everything and I found that three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, if I write for three hours each morning, and then I sort of go with the flow in the rest of the time it felt like I was in the flow of something. I felt really good about it. It was great. Like, and it was like, this is, it was such a reminder. It brought me back to that moment in Taipei, that first month of re really finding that same energy and flow. And it was like, this is it. And then I'm realizing, damn, this means I am doing something for the next six to nine months that does not involve making money. Uh, I've had to pause my podcast, slow down my newsletter, stop promoting other stuff, stop posting on social. And at the same time, the sales of my first book are falling. Uh, a course I created, the sales of that are declining. And it was like, man, but this is what it's all about. <laughs> and it's so good. Like, man, I love it so much. I love the challenge of writing a book. It's, it's so satisfying. And I know at the end of my life, these are the moments, the experiences, the chapters in my life I'm going to be like so happy with. And so it's just figuring that that's what I want. But what does that mean? That means we have a kid now and we're probably still going to rent. Right. Mm. And we're probably not going to have like super nice things. I don't know if we're going to be able to like pay for college in the future, which is like a huge goal for a lot of parents in our friend group. And just being okay with that. It's like, okay, we're okay sacrificing that. Uh, will it definitely be true? We're not sure, but we'll see. And we'll figure it out as we go. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Like it's, I think one thing I love about your book and all of your book is you're very honest about everything. Cause there will be people who are like, <laughs> yeah. we I'm um, living this fancy life and stuff. And you just, you're very honest about what you value and what this, the sacrifice that you're okay to let go with, what the, the things that the superior, the material stuff that other people value way too much than maybe they should have, um, yeah. that you just don't care that much. And it, really says something that you talked about in the book about leaving money on the table, right? You said that leaving money on the table does not mean never making money. In fact, in fact, it might mean making more money later. Then you just talk about your daughter um, going to college. In my mind, because I was like, that's 18 years later, I think. Yeah. Um, you definitely, maybe being a parent will be more cautious about what you want to build for your children for your kid's life in the future. But with the mindset that you have, I, I for one, wouldn't be worried. And how does this uh, philosophy play out for you on this leaving money on the table? And what would you say to someone if they're on the fence about stepping away from a traditional career due to financial concerns, especially someone would maybe have a family? Um, how should they think about it? Yeah, I, th I think if you're doing it and you want more space and time and flexibility in your life, you should just realize that that will probably mean at least for a few years, you're going to make less money. Right. And so you really have to be clear about valuing that time. I like to joke that my personal time and creative time and time with my family is worth a million dollars an hour. So I'm getting paid a lot more to not work. <laughs> Yes. Right. Like <laughs> but you, you, it's it's hard because there are financial concerns right now. We um, I was lucky with like a huge boost in sales of the pathless path. 
I don't know how this book will do. Um, but it's just being comfortable with like figuring things out as you go rather than I think on the default path, since you're working all the time and mm -hmm. theoretically you're just going to keep working full time for the rest of your career, you can aim at these milestones. It's like, okay, if I make the same as I'm like, if you're committed to your career and you're, uh, if you're listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. like you're probably competent enough to stay employed. Um, you're going to basically make what you're making now or more for the rest of your working career. And so if you're saving money now, you know you can keep saving for the future. And so you can work toward these goals. This year, my income dropped about 40, maybe 50% by the end of the year. We'll see how this book does. And that means we're probably going to have to make some changes next year which is fine. Like we're totally comfortable with that, like scaling up and down our life. But yeah, some people don't want that. Some people want a fancy house. And the thing is like, just be clear. If you want the fancy house, don't delude yourself into thinking uh, you can have it all in terms of the time freedom and stuff. I don't know if you can. For me, it feels like I have it all now because I don't desire those things that many other people want. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's totally true because I I was in Lisbon for a while earlier this year. I just feel like, I mean, a, a place to stay is so much cheaper. The weather is so much nicer <laughs> and things are fresh. People are friendly. True, the way that I can live in Lisbon maybe is a little bit uh, more than people who are from Lisbon can afford. But I think for most of the people, like you said, who are listening to this podcast should be able to find the, the benefit of being able to control your own time, meaning that you have all op more options to scale down the way that you live by not giving up the upside of the quality of life. Yeah, I, I think that's a, but it's easy well, for me. I don't have a family. So like <laughs> for other people. Well, maybe, I think it's confusing to people like if you're making a hundred thousand dollars and you get offered a job for eighty thousand dollars it feels like a terrible decision to go do that most people turn that down yeah. right but if people get offered a hundred and twenty thousand almost everyone takes the next job yeah right but what I effectively did was go from a hundred and fifty thousand dollars to thirty five thousand dollars. Um, yeah. but I, I wouldn't have taken a job for that, mm. right? If somebody offered me a $35,000 job, I would have been like, that's insane. I can't live on that. But, but the reality is I found I was able to live on that and I got paid in other benefits, peace of mind, connecting with myself for the first time, showing up as a happier person, attracting better people into my life having this creative energy that was like fulfilling me. But the problem is all those benefits are hidden. Yes. You can't, you can't show up to your, your friends group and like have a, a poster showing like, look at all my hidden benefits I'm experiencing in my body about how I feel about myself. They're like, aren't you nervous? You don't have a job. It's like, no, this is the best I've ever felt in my life. Right. And so it shifts from, visible benefits and hidden costs if you're unsatisfied in a career to visible costs and hidden benefits and that just means you're going to get less status and people are not going to think you're doing a smart thing i think so i think it's also difficult to show people like for example if you're going to take a thirty-five thousand dollar job you're not going to control your time, right? So it's like, of course, not worth of your time. Whereas if you willingly voluntarily drop your income to one third of your previous uh, pay package, but then you're actually, the, the difference is what you pay for yourself, as you said, to spend time doing things that you like. So it's completely a different game. I, I was wondering uh, if you think of the by hour pay, Possibly yeah. more than when you were paid by the six-figure salary, even when you... Not, not if you count the writing time. 
because I wasn't making any money writing and I was spending a lot of time writing and reading and all that. Um, but yeah, maybe per hour on some of the consulting work I was doing to pay the bills, it was pretty good. It yeah. was probably better than my previous job. But yeah, it, it, it was sort of shocking to me and it actually cured my financial insecurity. So when I quit my job, I didn't have anything lined up and my savings just start shrinking. Right before I quit my job, I have to sign back a check for $24,000 to my employer. So instantly I lose a third of my savings. I'm down to $50,000. Then it starts shrinking and I'm like panicking. Um, so I make a bunch of money uh, doing consulting projects over the first year. But then I decide, okay, I'm going to stop looking for consulting projects and just go with the flow and see what comes up in life. And yeah, I, I felt bad. But then over time, I, for the next three years, I was able to make between like thirty and forty thousand dollars a year, um, basically cut like break even on like what I was spending and what I was making, and I felt incredible. And yeah. so it cured a lot of my money insecurity, which I didn't even know how intense it was because it was sort of masked in a stable paycheck life. Um, and realize like, this is actually what I want in life. Creativity, connection with my work, presence for my family. And that's it. That's the full life I want. That's so good. It's so beautifully captured. I think the financial insecurity concern definitely is on a lot of people's mind. And the other thing is people wouldn't be able to experience the hidden benefits on a different yeah. path. You mentioned in some of the other podcasts, I've done my research about like a three month sabbatical to help people reset. Um, would you, do you want to suggest someone prepare, uh, if you want to suggest someone prepare for that, if they're like feeling overwhelmed? Or yeah. Like so this is basically what I would, like I sort of stumbled into sabbatical mode. Uh -huh. So once I decided to stop trying to make money, I was in the US for a couple months, just sort of wandering around. Then I showed up in Taiwan and like, during the sabbatical, I found writing and my wife. So I'm very bullish on sabbaticals. But I think people look at not working as such a big risk. Again, the if you're listening to Lydia's podcast, you're obviously very intelligent. <laughs> and uh, you're smart enough to figure out how to get a job again. Right? And so three months is not a big deal. Three months out of the 500 you might work in your career. So if you're going to work for 40 years, yeah, you're probably going to work about 500 months, 400, I don't know, what's that, 480, maybe yeah. a few more years brings you to 500. That's less than 1% of your working life. And then 99% of the people I've talked to we're like, oh my gosh, I wish I did this earlier. This is the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. Now, I think the best time to do it is probably sometime in your 30s. That's probably uh, maybe a slightly controversial take. But I think taking it too young, like you just don't have enough of experience of what you like, don't like, um, competence in the things you're doing. I think if you do it in your early 30s, mid 30s, 40s, you have enough life experience and wisdom and things you've gone through to look back on and reflect on. And yeah. some people go back to their jobs. I'm actually publishing a post on my newsletter this week about somebody that took a year off and went back to his job and he's like thriving now. And this happens more than people think. But it's that perspective yeah. shift that enables people to do that. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, was it you were on Lenny's uh, podcast? Yeah. He has this sabbatical concept. And it happened when I was in my 20s. I was in Hong Kong, right? Like, it's like one of those cities nobody will take any break, like compared no. to the US, even more. But every now and then, there will be one person. They would be like, we are going for sabbatical. And then they will never come back. <laughs> like, 100%. They will never come back for sure. No one, <laughs> yeah. 
Some people go back temporarily. My friend Cecile Marion in the book, um, she went back to her job for a four day week for a year and then had to quit again because something in that sabbatical initially planted a seed in her for a vision of a bigger life. And yeah, it takes a long time. And that's why I was trying to bring alive in the Angie chapter and the sabbatical chapter is like, this is a long journey. Mm. You're not just going to figure it out in a year. It's probably going to take three to five years. But a sabbatical can be a way to taste one, the negatives of like, ooh, this is really uncomfortable. And the positives of like, wow, I'm really excited to work on this thing. And nobody's asking me to do this. Yeah, let the natural instincts come out. I I agree with you and some like to take a sabbatical in their 30s, because for me, I'm about to be 35 this year. And I think what you just said, some of my friends also said it to me, like at this age of our life, we have enough experience and evidence that's there to show that we're competent enough if yeah. we want to build a life that we want. And and people, they can go on sabbatical. They may want to go back to their job. They can. Right. Yeah. I often like, this is why I love fear setting. It's like, what are the steps I would need to take to get back to where I am now? Yeah. And for many people, they have a boss that likes them or some connection somewhere. And the step is literally, oh, send one email. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I always yeah. think that like for the things that if you are completely on your own, you're exploring things, then there will be actually more opportunities than you're just sitting behind the computer and thinking that your life is miserable if you're miserable. Yeah. The and so I, I would take a job. I write about this. Like if I, if we need to meet the needs of what we actually want in our lives for our family, I would gladly do that. It's very easy to conceive of that now that I have a daughter. I'll do anything for her. Yeah. And, But I'm probably not going to go do project-based consulting. But I could definitely see doing like, okay, maybe I take a part-time job as somebody that's like leading content for like bringing alive a new voice of a company that's growing and trying to figure that out and do creative stuff. I could definitely do that, but I never could have imagined wanting to do a job like that seven years ago. My only imagination was I'm a consultant. I'm good at this. I need to do other things that look like consulting or strategy work. Yeah. Cause we always reinvent ourselves. I think to look ahead and now you have this new book. And I also want to circle by a quote from The Pathless Path. You said that we invent the stories we use to guide our lives, and these stories will continue to evolve. Exactly what we just talked about. So you're on the verge of launching the new book will be coming out next, which is which is the exact day? Uh, the 16th, um, 16th, Monday, September 16th. I think yeah. the paperback will come out a day later. But yeah, that that's pretty much it. Yeah, so by the time this uh, episode aired, it will be a few days into you publish the new book. What, what, what? Uh, how do you see your own story evolving, and what's the next step? I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> I have no idea. I'm excited to find out. I really don't have a plan. <laughs> this, this is like the funny thing when people actually meet me and then meet me and Angie. It's like we're really just making it up as we go. And we're really comfortable in that phase. We don't have a lease after December and we don't have a plan yet. We're contemplating moving to Asia um, to help our daughter learn, uh, grow up in more of a Chinese speaking environment. Yeah, do uh, it. But yeah, we, we don't know. We're looking at places like Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, Taiwan, but TBD. It's so good to have this conversation because I have no lease at the moment. <laughs> like <laughs> my plan, my plan is to go go to Lisbon for the winter and that's it. So I'm just like that's great. I'm kind of yeah. jealous of your no lease. Like me and my wife are not lease people, but it it's definitely something that uh, we needed during the first year of our daughter's life. Now we're finding it a bit easier. Yeah, it's more difficult to have when you have a family. I. I figure 
how do you decide what projects you work on? I'm just w- reading this book by Derek Sivis, like Hell Yeah or No. And some people, yeah. like Matthew Dix, I interviewed him early on in this podcast. He's, he has a say yes to everything policy <laughs> as well. So how do you how do you decide what to say yes to or say no to? Yeah, so this has been a challenge since having a kid too. Yeah, basically the book has been the hell yeah. I love Derek's um, decision-making framework. And I don't really know what's next. I think um, I am working on a hardcover edition of The Pathless Path, like a really nice version, like a collector's edition. And that's really fun for me now. That's sort of a bet that's going to cost a bit of money and I'm investing in. And yeah, I don't really know. I'm really just trying to be open with putting the book out there. I'm probably just going to promote it for a while. That's part of writing a book Mm. and going to see what emerges. Some people say that like moving to a location um, that's concentrated with what you want to do will be helpful. Do you have that uh, location? Yeah, I think Austin's been great for me. I think that has been huge in reclaiming my ambition Uh and um being around other creators and writers doing interesting things like this has made me feel normal. I think even while I was abroad, I didn't have those people physically close by and being in Austin, like there's just all my friends are doing weird internet entrepreneurial stuff. And I do feel really accepted. That's been so huge, but more importantly, it's helped me accept myself. And say like, okay, yeah, this is who I am. And so this is sort of what I wanted to bring alive in the book is that even though I was confident that I wanted to commit to this work, it was still hard to fully accept that that's the path I was choosing in my life. And so that was very emergent over four, five, six years. And yeah, it's so important. I think it's the most important thing on a path. If you're doing weird stuff, you need to find people doing similar things. Yeah, which is why we're having this conversation. Exactly. I, and that's just, that's why I have the podcast. It's very selfish for myself. So yeah. like same for me. Success, yeah. What does success mean to you then? Now it sounded like you found yourself, you know who you are now. Um if you define it for yourself or you I think it really starts with I mean, my daughter and my wife are the most important people in my life right now. So can I show up fully as a good connected version of myself to them. Mm. Right. That's really my North star right now. And so I need to be honest if I'm disconnected or I'm not, or I am connected, like, am I showing up as that and keep coming back to that. And I think with a kid, especially in the first year and a half, every month is different. So it's like a new life every month. So I'm constantly having to reset and check in. But luckily, like I said, like Angie's just a great partner to have on this journey. And we're pretty open and constantly talking about how we can uh, live the life we want. That's amazing. It's like showing up as a as the husband and the father you want to be there for them. Let's imagine if it's 2040, let's say, like, let's imagine it's 2040 and then your kid is right about to go to college. And if if they come to you for advice, how they should live their life, plan their career and approach adventures, what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, we want to have future kids as well. And I just want them to find a place where they feel connected to themselves. And... Yeah, I I don't care about the achievements and all that. Like, I want my kids to be able to follow their dreams, whatever that may be, even if it's something that makes me uncomfortable. Wow, that's so powerful. Let's hope I can cut cut this clip to you, and then maybe by twenty four they can send it. Yeah, send to you. (laughs) Please send it. Yeah, yeah, but like twenty forty. Yeah, my AI bot will probably just auto post it for me (laughs) or download it to my brain. I have no idea what 2040 is going to look like, (laughs) but I'm excited to find out. Yes, excited for the future. That's, um, I think that's a good place to end. We have a lightning round and are you ready for the lightning? Let's do it. 
to it. Best and worst career advice you've ever received. Uh, worst career advice is: Don't you think you should stay longer in your job? <laughs> Almost every time, I wish I had left earlier. Um, best career advice. I don't. I feel like I haven't got much good career advice. I from yourself. I think I've had to find it for myself. Uh, mm. I think a lot of the best career advice has come from David White. Oh, and it's about seeing work in a broader lens with a more expansive language. Mm. So the best career advice is comes from the courage I've gotten from his books, which sees work as a portal to connecting with yourself. Nice. Second question. You wrote about getting rid of your possessions before going to Taiwan. If you could only keep one thing, what would it be? I mean, it, it'd have to be my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> like that's the only way I'm like viable as a human, but what w would I keep? Out of I don't know. I'd I'd probably keep a copy of the Pathless Path. Like that year of writing and the process is just so special to me. Yeah. So I'd probably keep a copy of that just to remind myself of what is important to me and what it's all about. Nice. What's your favorite book of the year or favorite podcast or media? Um, really enjoyed, um, so Nat Eliason, I don't know if you read his stuff. Oh, yes. I, I have invited him to the podcast. Nice. You can he hasn't tell him later. He, he, we haven't scheduled yet, but, um. He's writing like crazy, but I've been able to write with him consistently. Um, his book is really good and just inspired about how he's injected his personal story into his writing. I've learned a lot from him and been inspired by his journey. Really good book. Mm. Um, nice. trying to think what else, uh, another book I read, um, is called, hold on. Uh, I have an early copy of it from Marsha Heath, uh, little giant. little giant. It's a story of two people who started a surf shop in the early two thousands in Aruba, like quit their jobs. And then what was cool about this book is Marsha is she's sort of uh, a former worked in a publishing house. She always wanted to write a book, never did. And then finally, during COVID, she decided to write it. So you could sort of feel the energy of her doing that throughout the book. So that was really good. I loved um, that book because it was very personal. It's very like a pathless path story. Um yeah, and I'm trying to pump it because she doesn't have a huge audience. Um, so definitely recommend Little Giant, the story of Aruba's surf shop and the rebels who built it. Great. We'll put a link. Um, yeah. What's your one habit or practice that keeps you grounded these days? Um, probably just drinking coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the same thing? I Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's like the only consistent thing I do anywhere. I don't really have habits. I mean, that and fitness and just staying exer exercising. Like my daughter keeps getting heavier, so I need to stay strong <laughs> to keep Do you keep do the with her? with her? Like use her as a... Um, Sometimes, a yeah. <laughs> That's so cute. Who I should invite to the podcast? Uh, the next... Trying to think who'd be good. I think there's a lot of people in my community. Are you in my community? I don't know. What what community? I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an invite to join. I have a community, the Pathless community. I don't do a good job of promoting it at all. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people in there on interesting paths you could probably interview. Yeah, good. Um, so the one last segment is you're going to answer a question from a previous guest. The question is kind of long. So imagine <laughs> who's you the have guest? Um, he is a co-founder of a nonprofit co called Carbon Gap nice. uh, called Eli Mitchell Larson. So his question is, imagine if you had six co other copies of yourself, 
and you don't you couldn't reveal their existence how would you divide tasks among them would you collaborate as one superhuman or would you divide and conquer would you even want that what would you do with six paul millers <laughs> so long. yeah i would definitely send one back into the consulting world i just want to see what happens yeah <laughs> like <laughs> I, it may be a disaster. Like it'd probably end in divorce and uh, like um, very b- bad destruction in my forties. But I would like to see what happens in that life path. Maybe maybe it turns out better than I expect. Um, I'd probably also. I don't know. I don't want to mess with the timeline. This is so risky. Yeah, like what. Um, version of yourself you're going to send back to the consulting world like the version of you now or the version seven years ago you get six copies yes right yeah. well, i don't know when are the cop i need more clarification this is too complex of a question we need a whole podcast for this <laughs> it's a good co- topic for another podcast yes <laughs> yeah um yeah i i don't know i i think i'd probably um, yeah, I'd want to copy myself now and send it back to the consulting world. Cause I think that'd be more interesting. I'm so much wiser about who I am now. Yeah. I'd probably yeah. quit after a day if I sent myself back now though. I'd be like, this is stupid. <laughs> and then the, the rest of five, maybe would do the childcare routine. Yeah. I would get, I would send like three or four of them to full dad mode. Yes. That's the best. Like being being with your little kid is man, 18 months year, year olds or 18 month olds are so fun. Yeah. It's the best. That's a nice place to be. I wish I have copies of myself. <laughs> <laughs> so you you leave a question for the next guest as well. Uh what brings you alive? That would be mine. Simpler. Hmm. What brings you alive? For for listeners who are listening, feel free to leave a comment as well. Well, thank you so much for your time, Paul. I cannot imagine like if you asked me two years ago, I'll have a podcast with you. I would tell whoever said that that's insane. So really, really appreciate your time and showing up and answer all of my questions. I appreciate that. Uh, also, I'm not. I'm just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> I'm just another person. Um, and you you are too, which means you can do great things too. I'm on my own way trying to figure yeah. things out. And hopefully I'm rooting we, for you. Yeah, I will stay in touch. And hopefully one day we can meet in person as well. One, uh, one day, maybe. Definitely. I will, yeah, follow. I'm not good at keeping up with people now, but if you find me in a place, just send me a message. Yeah, exactly. And uh, how can people find you? Is it still the, have you updated your website or? anything i don't have a book website yet <laughs> i need to do that uh pmiller.com is my personal website and then pathlesspath.com also has my book stuff on that i should have a book site up but if you go to pmillard.com slash good work uh you will get redirected to the amazon page and yeah ex- excited to hear from people if you enjoyed this reach out let me know um what your journey's like and happy to help yeah thank you so much for your time i think hopefully we can make each other's reach broader to more audience and encourage more people just to reach out connect if you're on this path yourself um there's people who like yourself like paul and some other creative people who are on the way and yeah thank you so much for your time really cool. thank you ladies.